Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I think everyone is just about on. There we go. Okay. So welcome to Earth Day 365's Green Your Home series. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Program Manager of Recycling on the Go at Earth Day 365. Um, we are streaming live to Facebook today, so I'm having everyone start with their camera off and muted. Um, but later, if you have questions, um, I will allow you to unmute yourself and you can feel free to um, do that and ask questions or use the chat. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, if you just um, move your mouse a little bit, the chat button is at the um, bottom bar below your screen, and that's also where your mute and camera buttons are. Um, so today we have um, Green Jean Ponzi from the Earthway Center at Missouri Botanical Garden, um, and she's presenting Smarter, Greener, Cleaner. She serves as the Green Resources Manager at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. Um, she's a 25-year veteran of the Earthway Center team and applies her sustainability expertise as a manager of the St. Louis Green Business Challenge operator of the Garden's Green Resources Info Service, and she's on the leadership team for the regional initiative Biodiversity St. Louis. Um, Green Jean is in demand as a speaker, writer, and media spokesperson, offering audiences both practical options and ecological inspiration. Thank you so much for being here, Jean. Happy to be here. All right. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Elizabeth, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to St. Louis Earth Day for putting on this Greening Your Home series. Um, I am very uh, honored to see some of my colleagues in green in the audience. So um, in addition to giving you some information that I hope will be helpful, uh, consider this some ways to communicate about these concepts because if we are uh, taking the position of being leaders and being encouragers of our fellow humans to do green stuff. It's always helpful to know how to talk about it without starting an argument or, you know, getting your message across. So I'm going to screen share here. I have some PowerPoint and I also have some props that I'm going to use as we're talking. And I, I would really prefer if folks would type their questions into the chat and then Elizabeth, you can monitor that. That's just a little bit smoother when we're on Facebook live. Uh, and also recording a program. I think having had the delightful experience of using Zoom now for months, me and Zoom, well, me and platforms. When this COVID-19 is over, the only platforms I'm gonna mess with will be shoes. Okay, so smarter, greener, cleaner. And I put them in that order for a very, very important reason, because there are uh, there are certainly options. There are degrees of green or shades of green in this era of COVID-19. We may be using heavier duty cleaners. We may be using more intensive cleaning protocols than we would have before we were dealing with such an urgent thing as the spread of the uh, novel coronavirus. So, and being a savvy consumer, a green savvy consumer is a very, very important part of greening your home in a sustainable and sensible and affordable way. There we have the garden's logo, Earthway Center, we're the sustainability division of Missouri Botanical Garden. And we have many, many resources that we can share with you uh, on our website. I'll have that at the end. So, you know, who, here we are in the circle of life. We're on the food chain, think back to that cycle of nutrients and cycle of energy that we all learned in elementary school. We are the ones that have to rely on the plant world. I do work for the Missouri Botanical Garden for all of our nourishment. Even if we are animal eaters, those animals have eaten plants. But then there's the whole thing about us being consumers, like we're supposed to buy a lot of stuff, right? There is that expectation. Marketing taps into the phenomenon of our emotions and being able to appeal to our emotions in really, really big ways that is capable of, promote, of persuading us to do sometimes some really dippy stuff. So let's be aware of those reactions. When there is an emotional reaction to a product or to a marketing word, just you know, be a little mindful of that. Check in with yourself and make sure that you're not being manipulated by something. Yes, we are consumers. We cannot produce our own food from sunlight. 
And a lot of the products that we produce are very innovative. There are also a lot of products that we produce that are, I would call them non-essential. Some of them maybe even harmful to the rest of the planet that we share. So let's be savvy until we get to the end of the food chain down there with the decomposers and the worms can take over. So how much do we care about green? This is a little, um, this is a little information that I was able to update. Uh, this was a Harris poll. It was conducted for the firm SCA that has produced uh, products like paper napkins, Torque brand paper napkins, T-O-R-K, maybe one that you use in your business or institution, or you've seen that name on a napkin dispenser. This dates back to 2014, so you know this is a little bit dated, especially in light of events of 2020. But this is a pretty good, out of the sampling of people that were surveyed, it's a pretty hefty percentage that said they, of Americans, that have reported purchasing some green products and reporting being willing to pay more and realize that there are people who are not able to be willing to pay more. This, you know, there's a level of privilege implied there for products that are ethical. If the practices are guaranteed, well, how do you know that? You have to read the label, unless you're a green geek like me and you're digging into all kinds of stuff online. Younger adults, 18 to 34, significantly more likely to pay more than older consumers, age 35 plus. Think about this, this is generations of humans that have grown up with things like recycling in schools and in our homes. Some of those fundamental green practices and awarenesses and studying things like ecology in elementary school. I did not get ecology. I was lucky to get to take shop class and I learned how to wire a lamp. Uh, so the majority of US consumers, again, from this, this one survey, purchase green products or services because we are concerned about the environment, you know, the wealth, and that's kind of a nebulous term. Health is also a motivator there. And it was interesting to me to see that in this survey sampling, that the younger adults are more motivated by health benefits versus older adults. I would be very interested to see a similar survey result now in 2020, given what we're dealing with with coronavirus. So, how do you know what's green? There are an awful lot of labels out there. There are an awful lot of marketing tools out there. And as the little guy down on the bottom of the screen rah, 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 indicates, there's plenty of green washing, like whitewash, hogwash, brainwash, unsubstantiated green claims. These are some of the legitimate ones. And I apologize for the little bit of fuzzy image here. This is a, a, you know, a group of things copied from an image online. I'll show you some of the, more of the specifics. And understanding which seals, which certifications really have some veracity is a very important thing to be a savvy consumer. Up on the right here, the circle with the maple leaf birdies, that is from Canada, that is environmental choice. We do see some products that have eco logo, that is also a Canadian certification and environmental choice coming into the US, but not, you know, that's, that's a little bit more peripheral. The other two are, these are for home maintenance products. And this is a lot of what I'm gonna focus on. Green Seal is an independent third party testing laboratory. They evaluate cleaning products. They evaluate paints coatings, adhesives, green seal, primarily you will find green seal certification on commercial level products, very rarely on consumer level products, except maybe for paints. And by the way, every major paint line now has a line of paint, if not they're all of their lines of paint that are free of volatile organic compounds, the stuff that gives you a headache when you get a new room painted. The, the biggest one here on this slide is the one that is most common for U.S. consumers. This comes from U.S. EPA, Safer Choice. This was originally called Design for the Environment, DFE. Nice, but obscure. So EPA rebranded their certification of home cleaning and maintenance products back in Oh, I want to say it was maybe like 2014, maybe even a little bit later than that. So now we see Safer Choice on an increasing number of product labels. 
And when you see the little home graphic there at the top of Safer Choice label, that is designed to indicate a, uh, a consumer level product. And here I'm going to hold this up. I'm like, are you reading this? Am I reading this right? Uh, no, I'll wait till I get out of my screen share. I can show you a little more about Safer Choice. So you can look for Safer Choice. What happens with a certification like this is a, a manufacturer has to apply to the certifier. The product has to be evaluated. In the case of US EPA, it is the product's claims and to some extent the product's performance that is evaluated by EPA labs. And if the product meets the standard of the certification program, in EPA's case, it means that cleaning product does not contain any of a list of chemicals of concern that EPA has identified. And then that product can display the certification. So it's a good one to look for, and it's a good one to, uh, you know, be aware of and tell people about. And more and more products are coming up, showing up now with a branding like Safer Choice. In building-related stuff, you see Safer Choice's older and more famous cousins, Energy Star, the most highly recognized logo in one in the world certainly in the US, us it may be one of the most highly recognized logos in the world and then water sense also an epa certification which is applied to things like faucets and shower heads and dishwashers and appliances and fixtures that use water in a building related context we have the very well-known lead uh Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Certification from the U.S. Green Building Council. I know we have at least one person on this class today that knows all about LEED. Angela Moore of the Missouri Historical Society has led her nonprofit to get LEED Gold Certification for their Soldiers Memorial Museum and just recently earned zero waste certification for that same facility. We have some really giants of knowledge and experience in our community to tap into. So if you're looking to learn more or to get some advice or to be able to see some of this stuff in action at the Missouri Botanical Garden, our Green Resources Info Service can direct you to resources like Soldiers Memorial Museum or other green building certified things or um, you know, certainly give you share information like this. So here's another level of green. This applies to paper products. And I'm putting this in because paper products are a really big one in our homes. FSC is the top of the line. FSC stands for Forest Stewardship Council. It is an independent evaluator of forest products that evaluates forest products from the standing tree and the healthy forest it comes from all the way to the product and in some cases even evaluates uh, forest product users like commercial printers. FSC is the top of the line. So if you're going to buy copier paper or you're going to buy notebook paper or um, it's kind of hard to find FSC certified toilet paper. Uh, the, the, the little paler green cousin to that is SFI that stands for the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Sustainable Forestry Initiative, say that five times fast. And that is the certification program of the forest products industry itself. This is something to be aware of. Many industries have their own certification and evaluation programs. The hospitality industry, for example, hotels. Many, if not most now, hotel chains have some level of green guidelines that they're franchisees or their local operators practice, but those are certification programs that are internal to the enterprise itself as opposed to external. And then I wanted to put this on here too, because when you're looking at products like, um, you know, when you're looking at packaging and you're looking at buying stuff that is going to have less of an environmental impact all the way down the line or know what you can do with a container when it's done, when you're done with it. The Sustainable Packaging Coalition, which is a trade association, has developed this um, labeling system. It's called, uh, what's it called? How to Recycle is the name of this system. And it's designed to be little labels that go on the sides of packages. Pretty, look for it near things like nutrition facts so that you can see at a glance what kind of material this is, can it be recycled, 
Can it be recycled where you are? Should any particular, any specific um, uh, measures be, be taken with it? So for example, here's uh, this, the, the how to recycle label for a paper box. Yeah, yeah, you got the, this gets really squirrely. The recyclability icon, when the three chasing arrows are filled with a color, that means the product is recyclable. When they're empty, that means something else that's like very screwy. Nobody's gonna remember that kind of stuff. But this is a really good guideline and it is being increasingly used. So it says the type of item it is, what specific part is referenced, the box, for example. Yes, it can be recycled. And if it doesn't say any specifics like take this plastic bag back to the grocery store, then generally you can put this particular item with this material into your home or your workplace recycling with a clear conscience and know that it's gonna go down its own appropriate path. And then there is a lot of info on this website, how to recycle.info. This is drawing on, this labeling system is drawing on the green guides which are definitions that came from the Federal Trade Commission, originally developed in the 1980s, revised after many, 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 many years of no revisions in the early 2000s. The green guides give us definitions for things like biodegradable and compostable. And those two words, I'm going to let those be a mystery to you in this moment and go on. So this is another way to know what's green. This labeling system that allows you to evaluate packaging if you can purchase a product that's comparable to another one and you know that the packaging can be legitimately recycled, that's one of the things to do that's green. And understanding this labeling system is very helpful. So this is my favorite slide in this whole thing. These are some of the kinds of things that we will see on products to motivate us to buy something that's gonna be more expensive probably because it's greener. Uh, oh, down in the bottom here. Good housekeeping green. If you are a contemporary of mine, you will remember the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval. Good Housekeeping Magazine. This was like replace and then replacement or refund if defective. <laughs> Duh, right, where are you gonna send it? That is limited warranty to consumers. Read the fine print. That's where you get to see some of this goofy greenwashing. Greener product certified. Mmm, words like organic, unless that word is paired with USDA, as in certified organic foodstuffs, the word organic is totally semantics. Words like natural, bio, eco, environmental, those are all semantics. Those words are semantics. Here we have a great big green check mark, and here we have my ultimate favorite greenwashing, eco-friendly. Your dog is friendly. Hopefully your mate in life is friendly. Your coworkers, I hope, are as friendly as mine. If a product is claiming that it's friendly to you or the earth or the eco or the echo, if you're going to mispronounce it, I would call that bogus. Do not spend more money for that thing. Or if it's a thing that you like, realize Realize what you're doing and don't get suckered. Couple more things here and then I'm gonna come out of screen share. So these are some ways to avoid greenwashing. Again, this is the smarter part of smarter, greener, cleaner. What is your motivation for buying the green thing? Is it health? Is it that you want to do something good for the environment? What is telling you, what is documenting for you about that product? And often you have to figure that out at the point of purchase, unless you stand in the aisle with your phone and look up things, that documents that that really is a green thing. Who or what is claiming it's green? Who is the certifying entity? Who is the claimant? What are the alternatives? Sometimes those alternatives are like a DIY all-purpose cleaning product formula. Sometimes they're like not buying anything at all or buying an all-purpose cleaner versus a specialized one for some specialized usage. How do you make your choice? How do you evaluate that? What are the obvious kinds of greenwashing factors, friendly product, bleh. And if you kind of have a gut feeling that you're being greenwashed, trust your 
trust your feelings there because the, the, the more you think about things like this and the more you're aware of these criteria, the more you really will be very savvy about what it is you're looking for. If you really want to read about greenwashing, this comes from Terra Choice. That is a Canadian uh, certification program, the seven sins of greenwashing. And uh, oops, down in the very bottom there, uh, the, the website is Terra Choice, T-E-R-R-A-C-H-O-I-C-E. -E. These um, seven deadly sins are very interesting in the way they define greenwashing. So that's pretty fun reading if you want to develop more expertise. We have a, a video on our website, mobot.org slash sustainability is the Earthway Center part of the website. And usually when I give this talk, I show a couple segments of a video that we made in uh, with the Higher Education Channel about green cleaning specifically, about products and toxicity and alternatives to toxicity and safe disposal of products. I got to help produce that. I got to be in it. <laughs> Um, and it's called Detox Your Domicile, and you can watch it on YouTube. And it's, it's a pretty fun watch. It's actually the only thing that is not current in it is how do we collect household hazardous waste. There's a little segment that says, that, you know, it's like the, the containers from cleaning products and leftover home maintenance products and gardening products and stuff like that. That is a little outdated because it shows a drive-through collection the kind that our St. Louis County Department of Public Health used to host. We have two permanent collection sites now in our area for household hazardous waste. You have to make an online reservation to use them, hhwstl.org. They're run by St. Louis County Department of Public Health. County residents can dispose of unlimited amounts free City and Jefferson County residents pay, uh, get 50 pounds a year free and after that we pay a small amount of money and everybody pays to dispose of latex paint. So that's the only thing that is a, a little bit different from <clears throat> the, the information from when we made this program, Detox Your Domicile. And there's very fun segments in a lab with my old buddy Marcus Rivas, who is an EPA employee. He works for EPA Region 7 which is our region, and he came to St. Louis and he portrayed Dr. Detox with me in the lab. And we did fun stuff like looked at baking soda under a microscope and we're able to show that on a video camera to show that the uh, crystalline structure of baking soda shears away at gunk and that is why baking soda cleans everything. I am never without it in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in the laundry area. And I rotate through. So the newest stuff is in the kitchen, right? Duh. So check this out. Uh, I am going to come out of screen share now. And actually I'm gonna stop the virtual background too because I don't wanna be distracted from showing you a few things that I would like to show you. So, okay, label reading. Really, really elementary, but important to know. When you look at the products, uh, yeah, label reading, okay. So when you look at a product, usually a cleaning product, you will see that there is a word on the product in all capital letters down at the bottom of the package, usually caution, warning, danger, or poison. These are not semantics. These are actual legal limits of toxicity and they are a graduated spectrum. So danger or poison is the worst. That means that a taste to a teaspoonful, if you ingest it, can kill an average size adult. And these are US EPA definitions. They define an average size adult as a 250 pound male. So if you're smaller than that, I, thankfully I am, then the level of toxicity would be more intense for you. So danger, poison, that's the worst. Remember that. Next, down the line, we get the word warning. And that means that a teaspoon to an ounce taken by mouth can kill an average size adult. A little bit less lethal when ingested. Then we get the least of the offenders, caution. And caution means an ounce to over a pint taken by mouth can kill an average size adult. So you can chug pretty much of this before it knocks you off, but you don't want to do it. 
Okay, so that's caution. And then sometimes you will see on a label, a word like this, non-toxic. And you think, wow, that's really good. I'm gonna get that, right? That's the eco, it's the friendly one. What this means as a legal definition is no additional labeling is needed. And that translates into legally below a thir certain threshold of performance of toxicity, only a certain num number of rats died when they ate the stuff. So the term non-toxic seems like ding, 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 this is the one you want to go for. But it in fact is defining a threshold of less toxicity relative to testing protocols. It's good to know this when you're looking at products because there is no logic applied to the kind of product that has a kind of word. So this is a can of stuff that you can spray and fill your breathing space with chemicals that are designed to kill flying insects if the spray contacts the insects. And the term on the label is caution. It is the least intensive of the three right? This stuff kills living things. This is a product that is designed to swab the biffy. This is toilet cleaner. And on this label, you see the word danger. Remember the two ones on the red sign? Danger and poison. So the product that is designed to clean your toilet is significantly more toxic if you ingest it, a taste to a teaspoon taken by mouth, <laughs> significantly more toxic than the product that is designed to kill living things. My point there is there is not a logic of toxicity and labeling applied to product functions. It's how toxic is it if you ingest it? And those signal words, they're called signal words, they can also indicate and they would say that the product is, it could be toxic if you ingest it, it could be corrosive, like eat off your skin or you know, eat the linoleum off your floor. It could be ignitable or flammable, flammable. It could burst into flame or it could be explosive. <clears throat> and the product label will tell you that. Often there will also be good information on a product label about poison control, what to do with poison control and give you something like an 800 number for a poison control center. So what's a person to do, right? First of all, this is a chemical solution. This is a mechanical solution. It will improve your aim. I cannot hit any kind of ball with any kind of stick to save my soul, but boy, I'm good with flies. So a mechanical solution is in my humble opinion, almost always better than the chemical solution when you're trying to achieve some kind of home maintenance or home cleaning in. There are not a lot of rules in my profession where, you know, that's like a really, really good hard and fast rule, but okay, drain cleaner, Drano, once in every week, Drano in every drain, keep strains clean, free running and sanitary. This is like what's stored in the closets in my brain. However, a little gizmo like this, a sink strainer, this is really cool. They make great gifts. You just put this in your kitchen drain. They don't work in bathroom drains, the kinds with the little plungers, but in a kitchen drain, you just put this in there and it catches all the flotsam. The potato peelings, the, you know, the egg scrapings that came off the pan when you washed it, anything like that goes into the strainer and then you can toss that into the compost, that flotsam, or into your trash a mechanical versus a chemical alternative. Here's another one. This is a Lulu dryer sheets. I wish this was smell-o-vision because when I open this and look at that, mm, boy, doesn't that look refreshing on a summer day? Open that up and... <laughs> wow, why would you buy a product that you have to buy, use once, throw away, and then add smelly chemicals, mystery chemicals, to the laundry that you just tried to clean? Well, because we wear a lot of synthetic fabrics and they get staticky. So dryer sheets, the chemicals in dryer sheets will neutralize that static. But remember mechanical versus chemical. Think about walking on carpet in the winter. 
You're walking in your shoes, you're walking on carpet, you touch something metal. I don't have anything metal here. I'm gonna to have to use the plate in my skull. No, just kidding. You touch something metal and you get a shock and that static charge is released. That is a mechanical release of static versus the chemical release of static. So how do you do that? Well, you can buy products like dryer balls. Oh, they're just darling. They come in packages of two or three and look, they're squeezy and they're pink and blue and they bounce around in your dryer and they release that static charge. So your nylon and your, you know, your Teflon and your rayon and your synthetic fabrics come out of the dryer, unless you're using a clothesline, and they're not staticky. However, you could also use a good old tennis ball. When it's lost its bounce for the court, rinse the dog slobber off of it, put a couple of these in your dryer and they will bounce around and release that static. And the individual who thought of dryer balls was riffing on this idea and thought, whoa, I could make them pink and blue and pointy and squeezy and people would love them and people would buy them and they're just darling and they do. Marketing, gotta love it. And then here's the even better solution. A wool ball, this happens to be an alpaca ball, which lets me say alpaca balls in public presentations, um, made from fiber from alpacas of Troy here in our area. And when you have two or three of these bouncing around in your dryer, first of all, they're more quiet than tennis balls and dryer balls. And if you want to, you can put a little drop of um, essential oil on it to make your laundry smell like whatever smells like clean to you, or just bounce your alpaca balls around in your dryer. Just the other day, I was meeting at the Social Safe and Healthy Distance with my friend Katie Lacewell, who is a weaver, and she had a lot of roving, and we were felting. So I made myself a brand new pair of dryer balls. These have never been seen by the public before. Made them myself on a Saturday afternoon while visiting with a dear friend. I just made two how many do you really need? Plus I have my alpaca ball. So this is a kind of thing that you can purchase at farmer's markets. You can order them online, but you know, why not get them locally? Alpacas of Troy and use these things bouncing around. I actually was inspired to make them by an invitation to a socially distant baby shower that I'm going to and the mother to be requested some organic uh, dryer balls. I didn't have organic fleece, so I made some for myself. And then this takes me back to another very important thing about labeling and all this kind of stuff. Look at the scent here on these dryer sheets. Fresh linen. How does that really smell? I know how it would smell if I was smelling the armpits after wearing linen on a July day, but fresh linen? Come on now. Scent has an emotional connection. Scent goes right to our brains and triggers our emotions. And every single one of us has an emotional association with some smell that says clean. For some people that smell is the smell of chlorine bleach. I'm not making this up. For some people that is wintergreen or, you know, what is it for you? Is it pine? Is it lavender? Is it fresh linen armpits? Geez, I hope not. So when these products are marketed, they are appealing to our emotions and to deep-seated feelings and experiences that say things like clean. If you don't want that appeal and you don't want that smell, there is one hunk of verbiage that you can look for on a package that will guarantee that there are no mystery chemicals added to a product to make it smell like something. What is that verbiage? One legal hunk of verbiage is the two words fragrance free. That's what you wanna look for. That's again, the Federal Trade Commission that is truth and labeling in the US of A, look for the words fragrance free, natural fragrance, light fragrance, Oh, here's one of my really favorites. Can you read this? No heavy fragrances. Read the label. Be a schmarty. Okay, so 
Now I'm going to go back to screen share. Looks like we have a question in chat here. Nope, that is not a question. It's the connection to alpacas of Troy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so back to the screen share. Come on. There we go. Do, 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 detox your domicile. A lot of this, some of this is in detox your domicile. There also is a recipe for clean air cleaner, which is an all purpose cleaner that works well, will replace formula 409, Mr. Clean and Ajax and all those all purpose cleaners. And you can print out a PDF copy of this little booklet, Detox Your Domicile, that has that recipe in it. And that includes the signal words we just talked about and also has a little map in the middle of the booklet. I always give these out when giving this talk in person where you can walk around your home, especially with a kid and find the places where the toxic products tend to lurk and then make a plan to phase them out. So more label decoding, it gets more serious. And here we get into the area of COVID-19 um, health and safety and prevention. I learned this the hard way. Bleach, guess what? Bleach expires. It has a shelf life. And this is what you're gonna see on a bleach label. <laughs> this is not Best Buy, it is not Sell Buy. It's, you need a Rosetta Stone to decode it. And here is that kind of decoding. This is where I learned earlier this year to track down the kind of label codes that sometimes you just have to understand. So on any brand of a bottle of bleach, you will see a code like this, A8116010. What this code means is the first two digits are the plant number, the manufacturer's plant number where this particular jug of product was made. The next single digit is the last digit in the year that that product was made. They're not gonna say, I'm sorry, they're not gonna say 2011 or 2020 or whatever. The last digit in the year that product was made. And then the next three digit, the next digits are the day of the year that the product was made. So here's plant A8. This was made in 2011 not hopefully not one hopefully your bleach is not that old on the 160th day of 2011 do that calculation in your head and then i have no idea what that number 10 means at the end i couldn't find that out i'm sorry and on the bleach label this is literally a screenshot of a bleach label down here on the bleach label uh, you also will see some other code that is a mystery. If you can decode it, it probably will give you, you know, like the missile codes to protect the U.S. from North Korea. I, I'm not sure. But bleach expires. It has a shelf life of uh, about a year and it, more than a year, six months actually for hospital use because what happens with bleach is that over time the concentration of hypox, uh, hypo, hypo, shoot, what is it, hypochlorite, I believe, starts to turn back into a combination of salt and water. And after six months for hospital use, the bleach is no longer potent enough to do what it's supposed to do. After a year for home use, bleach should be replaced. It's no longer potent enough. And you can use bleach that is a year old or six months to a year old. You can use that in a little stronger concentration and it will do the same thing. I learned this the hard way at the beginning of COVID-19 because we had a jug of bleach in my house. I didn't think I had to get bleach because we had one. It turns out that it was manufactured in 2004. So it took me a while to get some new bleach back on the store shelves. A neighbor loaned me some and then a friend loaned me some really new stuff in order to do make DIY cleaning wipes. Lala. So I'll show you a few more slides here. These come from an organization that I highly recommend you check out and become familiar with and consider supporting Women's Voices for the Earth. They're based in Missoula, Montana. They are a nonprofit that specifically amplifies the voices of women around issues of concern, specifically around toxics in products that especially women use. So this is some screenshots of their COVID-19 cleaning infographic. One of the things is the difference between cleaning and disinfecting. Very, very different things, two very, very different things. So you wanna 
make sure that you're not filling your home with toxic chemicals. And now that we probably have our homes more closed up with air conditioning, in an enclosed space, toxics can become more concentrated. And you wanna be very aware of that, even while you're maintaining safety. Wash your hands. We do not have to use antibacterial and fragrant soap. Antibacterial, A, it is coronavirus. Bacteria and virus function differently relative to stuff that is designed to kill them or disenable them. Practice social distancing, obviously. Wear a mask in public. This is the very first things. This is the mechanicals, the, the basics of good mechanical maintenance. Sometimes you want to use these on your fellow humans too, not just on your flies. Keep your surroundings clean. Um, this was an interesting fact here. Studies in households of healthy people have never found that disinfecting at home does more to reduce illness than cleaning with regular soap and water. So the difference between cleaning and disinfecting, I believe I have a slide here that defines that. Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead to that for a second. Okay, cleaning and disinfecting. So disinfecting uses chemicals that will literally kill germs, whether those are bacteria or whether those are viruses. And you might need different subject sub substances to do that. Sanitizing is kind of the middle ground. Sanitizing, like when you're using hand sanitizer on your hands, the alcohol in that is kills the germs on your hands temporarily. It's less infective than disinfecting, but you don't need to disinfect your hands unless you're doing surgery. Cleaning, on the other hand, removes the gunk that allows the germs to reproduce. And mechanical acts of washing and soap, which breaks down the, uh, the fatty acids on the outside of, say, coronavirus, um, coronavirus particles, soap and mechanics, that is one of the most useful things you can do. Cleaning just with water, just rubbing and with water, cleaning off your groceries, for example, if you, if you do that, if you practice that. I do clean off the, my bags of shredded cheese and you know my plastic container of cream cheese. I have been changing uh, produce from one container to another. I keep a clean container and then I either wash out the new one or I put it in the recycling. Uh, wash off cans. I have been doing that, taking stuff out of boxes and recycling the boxes. Now what we know about COVID-19 is transmission on services is not as intensive as was originally thought by the CDC when we first had COVID in our society, but still people are being, people are being careful and it's good to err on the side of carefulness. So cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, they are three levels of maintenance and cleaning is by far the most important of those. Okay, so back to uh, la, 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 la. you want to avoid exposure to things like antibacterial soaps. You want to avoid cleaners with dyes or fragrances because those are mystery chemicals. Just plain old good soapy water or water. And you know, granted, some people don't have access to running water or to fresh water to maintain this hygiene. That's one of the issues of coronavirus. And you want to prioritize cleaning, of course, of high touch areas, things that you may touch that others would have touched. That's something that we're doing as we start to reopen our workplaces or our institutions like Missouri Botanical Garden, Missouri History Museum. It takes a lot more, and schools, holy cow, this is an issue in schools. Um, should you disinfect? There, there is, yes, definitely, I think, a necessity to disinfect in public places where there are many, many people coming and going, but disinfecting in the home, unless you have someone who is in your home who is immunocompromised or who has another health issue and you know, you're trying to keep a person who has COVID away from somebody who doesn't. Disinfecting in the home is the least of the necessary precautions. And I think this is important information to get. And that includes use of disinfecting wipes. 
So you want to look for disinfectants for safer disinfecting with active ingredients such as alcohol, ethanol, not methanol. We just saw a whole list of hand sanitizers that had methanol in them that were considered toxic. Isopropanol, which is an ingredient in isopropyl alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, lactic acid, citric acid, and thymol. And thymol is the one, the greenest that I've sort of heard people discuss. I haven't had experience with that particularly, but these are good ingredients to know and to look for in disinfectants. Again, that most intensive measure in cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfectant. And here is a DIY hand sanitizer recipe two parts isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, one part aloe vera gel or vegetable glycerin that keeps the stuff on your hands until it dries. And, and that's it. You can, there are recipes for making your own kinds of this, but you got to really follow the recipe and you got to really make sure that you're using unexpired ingredients, not like my 2004 year old bleach. <laughs> it wasn't quite that old. Uh, and doing it right. And these are ingredients to avoid. Quaternary ammonium compounds, quats. Sodium hypochloride, chlorine bleach. If you can avoid using those, do avoid using them. Quats are ingredients in a lot of industrial strength cleaners. And one of the things that I'm gonna tell you as you're looking at this slide, Women's Voices for the Earth has developed a toolkit for parents to use to talk to schools about safer cleaning products. Because again, having a conversation, talking about sharing knowledge, sharing concerns, this is an important, very important thing to do. Quaternary ammonium products can uh, aggravate asthma. Uh, they, are, they are very serious cleaning products, do not have to be used in school settings. But schools are using the abundance of caution helping to educate your school administrators in a dialogue, a non-confrontational dialogue. The toolkit to do that, that includes some sample emails and messages is part of what you can get from Women's Voices for the Earth. And on my um, environmental show, Earthworms on KDHX, I did an interview with the young woman who developed that toolkit. That's another good thing that you might wanna listen to. So this is part, again, these are screenshots of a graphic from Women's Voices for the Earth about safer cleaning in the time of COVID-19. Some of the hazards of chlorine bleach, a significant lung and eye irritation, irritant can cause chemical burns on skin. I actually made my own um, Clorox wipes out of a roll of paper towel that I cut in thirds. It looks like I found this on YouTube. And I was glad to have it at the very beginning because I couldn't get wipes and everyone was getting wipes. It definitely irritated my skin to handle that kind of stuff. And I was touching the wipes without using gloves. And you know, if you're using gloves then you're disposing of gloves and can we get gloves? And there's all this crazy stuff. So cleaning is a very, very, very important strategy. And you can do that with products that are benign. Womensvoices.org. That is a great website to bookmark, cruise around it. They've got some other important campaigns such as their Detox the Box campaign, trying to get the toxic products, the carcinogenic products out of, out of tampons, out of menstrual pads, out of the kinds of products that are used by menstruating women in very absorbing parts of our bodies, important campaigns like that. And down here in the bottom, the last point about cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting. In order for disinfectants to work properly, surfaces must be clean and remain wet for the duration of the disinfectants wait time, anyway from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. When stuff dries out, the chemical compounds can't work as well. So understanding a little bit of that dynamic, it's a little bit of sort of like, um, um, hydrology, ecological hydrology in home cleaning. But definitely check out womensvoices.org. They do a great job and they have some really impactful campaigns and some excellent timely information.
Here's this guidance again. This came from the uh, Centers for Disease Control and US EPA. Periodically, we're seeing updates from EPA about the, for example, the hand sanitizers that have the toxic ingredient methanol in them. Um, EPA has evaluated and has a list, it's, it's intense reading of products that are effective for cleaning against COVID-19. And there are some uh, consumer level products. Most of them are commercial level products. And then we get to simple rules it's everywhere. This, I look at this time period, smarter, greener, cleaner coronavirus, right? A pandemic. It's like a giant timeout for the entire human species. We are a very impactful species. When you put a kid in timeout, it's because they've been acting out of accord with their surroundings. And you give them some time to reflect and to kind of come correct. And then you let them come back in again and be okay. We have some really simple rules for this big timeout. One is space. Give each other more space, twice as much space than we're usually used to. Face coverings, which have now become fashion accessories. Oh, look at this one. It's got flowers and insects on it. This is just, it was a birthday present from my dear friend, Deborah Frank. Wear a face covering. Some places are mandating that now. Some countries are mandating that now. These are wash your hands. If you can't wash your hands right away after being out in public at the store, in any kind of an interaction, you do use hand sanitizer, but then wash your hands as soon as you can after that. And use the barriers, use the physical, the mechanical methods, and then also use a spirit of kindness and consideration for our fellow humans. Really important thing to cultivate in terms of smarter, greener, cleaner. We have a green resources information service at the Missouri Botanical Garden. We will take your questions at any time about anything having to do with sustainable living. Dedicated email address, greenresources at mobot.org. That actually comes right to me. I am the green resources manager for the garden. And if I don't have the answer to the question, I will look it up for you, sometimes tap into the expertise of my colleagues or organizations around the community. Um, we, and also I, I get to promote my volunteer community service in these interactions, which is the show that I do now podcasting, Earthworms, Environmental Conversations, coming to you from St. Louis Independent Media, KDHX. As I said, really recently had an opportunity to talk to the staff member from Women's Voices for the Earth who developed the toolkit for parents to talk to schools about safer cleaning in the time of COVID-19. Excellent, excellent resources that are out there and that can help you be smarter, greener, and cleaner. Elizabeth, got a few minutes still from quest for questions. Just move my hair. Yes, absolutely. So as Jean said um, earlier, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to type those in the chat. Um, down that, bo that button is down at the bottom of your screen. Or, you know, if you want to unmute and ask them, it's okay with me now. I stopped talking mostly. Okay. <laughs> One thing I did not mention was personal care products. Personal care products are a whole nother ball game when it comes to toxics and regulation. They are an extraordinarily unregulated spectrum of products relative to toxic ingredients. So the environmental working group is the resource that I, I recommend. They have a program called EWG Verified Environmental Working Group that is licensing criteria and evaluation for personal care products. This was originally a database called Skin Deep and there is an opportunity, I believe, that you can still use when you're in a store and you want to evaluate the healthiness, relative healthiness or toxicity of a personal care product that is your preference. You can take a photo of the QR code of that product and upload it into Skin Deep, and that will help get that um, uh, product evaluated. But the EWG verified database is the best one that I know of for evaluating personal care products. That is a whole nother presentation. 
And that website, Elizabeth, you've been putting these up there so helpfully. Thank you. It is, I believe it is ewgverified.org. I should know this off the top of my head. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, there are lists of restricted ke chemicals. And, and, you know, it's like we just don't have a very hefty regulatory environment for stuff like this. There are squirrely things that slip through the cracks. The first campaign that I ran across from Women's Voices for the Earth when I met them through doing my show Earthworms um, was the campaign that they succeeded at in getting Johnson & Johnson, S.E. Johnson, a family company, to take out the carcinogenic ingredient in Johnson's baby shampoo. Every woman in America that has a baby in a public hospital gets a free bottle of Johnson's baby shampoo. And why was there a carcinogenic ingredient in there? I don't know. I can't remember. I have probably blocked it. But that was a Women's Voices for the Earth campaign that succeeded. They also have tried to get companies like, uh, again, this would be S.E. Johnson Glade to disclose the fragrance ingredients in certain things. Fragrances are defined by the Federal Trade Commission as trade secrets. So, um, I'm sorry, the Food and Drug Administration. So no manufacturer is required to disclose the chemical ingredients of a fragrance. And that's why the terminology fragrance free is the only one that will guarantee you no mystery chemicals added to your product to make it smell like fresh linen or armpits. Question, okay, uh, hydrogen peroxide versus rubbing alcohol or vodka for making reusable wipes. I'd say save the vodka for something more impactful. Hi, you've been stymied because you can't find rubbing alcohol. Hydrogen peroxide, apparently hydro hydrogen peroxide is also an option for making wipes. I do not know this from personal experience, but I think if you Googled hydrogen peroxide versus isopropyl alcohol, as an ingredient for DI wipes, you would get that information. Yes, and, it, and alcohol is now more widely available. I have actually seen it on shelves and gotten it off store shelves lately. Any other questions? Smarter, greener, cleaner. Put those in order for a very, very, very important reason because our savvy as consumers, our resistance to getting sucked into marketing campaigns is one of the greenest sets of tools that we have in our, um, in our resource bank to care for ourselves and our family and our community and our planet. Uh, doesn't hydrogen peroxide break down quickly to water and gaseous oxygen? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. It may. And uh, I'm I, sorry, I can't answer that, but that was a good question. Um, you did get some thank yous on Facebook, so I just wanted to note that. Um, someone suggested the uh, some essential oils for um, dryer balls. Yeah, um, and if you're going to use essential no. oils, you want to actually use the essence of whatever it is. You don't want to use like synthetic lemon or whatever. So you want to go to a place that sells real essential oils, Cheryl's Herbs in Maplewood, Missouri. You can get them at Whole Foods. You can get them at River City Nutrition in Kirkwood. You don't need a lot of that kind of thing. And again, if you want your stuff to smell like whatever that is, great. Can you live with it not smelling like something? And if you're concerned about repelling mosquitoes, then I would encourage you to not have your clothing smell like something because scent is one of the things that attracts mosquitoes. Um, and then there's, there's one question that's possibly rhetorical. Um, why is it so hard to convince people in my family, for instance, that cleaning products do not have to smell like toxic chemicals to be effective? <laughs> humans can't live with them can't live without them you know we, we've we have been conditioned by experience and we've been conditioned by messaging and I think that uh you know if it sometimes it's possible to cite a couple of facts sometimes it's most effective just to have a conversation and then practice the practices that are most significant to you um, 
Well, any last minute questions can come through. Um, if you did join late or need a refresher or you just want to hear Jean say alpaca balls again, you can find um, uh, the video at our website at earthday-365.org. Um, you'll go to the top, it says virtual programs. Um, and you can click around there. They've got, we've got all of our virtual programs so far um, on that page. And then this program will be on the virtual Green Your Home series page. So you can click that link um, and check back for other resources. We've got Perennial on there teaching us how to make unpaper towels and reusable disinfectant wipes. Um, and then Bob Hinkle gave us some recycling basics. Um, there's some living zero waste videos and um, I'm going to be adding some other uh, green your home resources so you can keep that page handy. And we're also putting together a food waste reduction program for late August, um, possibly with the St. Louis County Department of Public Health, um, as well as some environmental justice programming. So look out for those. Um, if there's not any last minute questions, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Jean, so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thanks to everyone. Stay smart, stay safe, stay green, and enjoy your new fashion accessories. <laughs> Colorful glasses for Zoom and masks to match every outfit.